Welcome everybody. It's great to see so many people in the seminar and it's particularly great to see uh, so many people returning that haven't been here for a long time. So I'm very thrilled about that. Um, so today we'll talk a little bit about uh, Dr. Darren Stefanischen. I'll be giving a short introduction for those who, of you who don't know me. My name is Walter Herzog. I'm the co-director of the Human Performance Laboratory. And Darren has been here for a long time. I have been here for a long time. He's working very applied and working very basic. So we didn't really work a lot together. We have collaborated on supervising students together and those type of things. But, uh, but I would like to take a few minutes and, and, and Darren told me how long his talk is. And I'm going, oh my God, my introduction might be longer than your talk. So <laughs> <laughs> my, my apologies, but, but, uh, but you know, this, this is the day where I think you are allowed to have, a, you know, a, an introduction that's, uh, that's a, a little bit longer. So let me get started with some uh, facts and some background on the education. So I guess, uh, first of all, happy belated birthday. I guess uh, Darren's definition was uh, 55 years old yesterday. And, uh, and I was just thinking, today is my late mother's birthday. So very close to it. So happy belated birthday. And also for those of you who are close to 55 years old, that's, that's when you obviously can reti retire. <laughs> 1990, uh, Bachelor of Science in Engineering from the University of Saskatchewan. And then in 1990 to 1992, uh, he was a production engineer for Shell Canada, Limited Calgary Canada, and made some very nice acquaintances there, as he might remember. Uh, Details shall remain uh, between him and I. And then in uh, 1992 to 1996, uh, he came uh, to the university, did a PhD in mechanical engineering, uh, with specialization in biomechanics with uh, Dr. Benonik, who is here as well. And of course, at that time was the director of the Human Performance Laboratory. So a few more facts. Uh, Darren initially started his graduate studies with uh, uh, Dr. Jack Engsberg, who did work on prosthetics and uh, unfortunately then left to the United States and Darren was left hanging. And that's when he switched uh, to study with uh, Ben Onig, transferring to the PhD uh, mechanical engineering program. And according to Benno, finished the program in three and a half years. And uh, Benno claims that was the fastest ever PhD that he supervised. So congratulations, uh, belated congratulations on that account. So interestingly, his thesis was about the effect of a stiff plate in shoes and running performance. And uh, I, I remember some of those seminars from 25 years ago uh, when he came. And if I remember it correctly, and he might correct me later on his talk, but if I remember it correctly, the argument was that when we run, we lose energy in the metatarsophalangeal joint. And uh, how can we get rid of that loss and therefore presumably make running more efficient? And the idea is, well, we stiffen up the joint. We put in a plate and we do that. And at least that's how I remember the initial argument went. And I'm going, the metatarsophalangeal joint. I remember exactly. I'm going, are you kidding me? Isn't, it's so tiny at the end, you know, right in front of your toes there. I mean, what does that have to do with running performance? But, you know, uh, 25 years later or 20 years later, uh, it obviously had an impact. And I'll talk briefly about that in a, in a second. And then he went, you know, uh, through various ranks uh, at the University of Calgary. And then since 2011, was a full professor in kinesiology. I want to talk a little bit about the awards that uh, Darren got during his career. And there's many, many listed uh, on his CV and also in our annual reports and so on. And so I'm, I'm focusing just on a few that I think will maybe give an idea about the prominence that he played uh, in the field because he was prominent in the field. Well, he is prominent in the field. Sorry, I should say was. <laughs> this, is, this is not a memorial lecture, is it? <laughs> so. Most importantly, of course, 
2000 HPL Faculty Leadership Award. But let's jump over that one. In 2010, uh, he won the American Society of Biomechanics Jim Hay Memorial Award. I personally consider that award the premier award, international award in sport and exercise biomechanics. And uh, he received that uh, uh, very early on in his career. And then the other thing that stuck out for me was uh, the Nike Award for Athletic Footwear Research. What stuck out there primarily was the $25,000. And I'm going, I should go into that field of research because I, I've never gotten a $25,000 Award for best presentation is uh, Gang Luo. There he is. There he is. Yeah. And there's more to more more to say about Gang because uh, there is this you know famous story that that everybody now in the lab knows, but some of the outsiders might not know that you know Gang was growing up in China. Uh, at one point, saw uh, one of the shoes. I think the N Nike Air Jordan there, and got all enchanted by it and decided at 11, 12, 13 years old that at one point he wanted to work for Nike and then, you know, made his way to Canada, made his way to there and, <clears throat> and then ended up at Nike. And I understand now even moved on to greater and bigger things from, from Nike. So, uh, so congratulations on that. But uh, so, uh, uh, and then of course, Gang and a couple of other people were, you know, part of that new shoe that was developed by Nike, the Vaporfly 4% that contains a plate and a lot of other things. But, uh, you know, I always claim, and not for me, but I always claim for the laboratory that really the principal initial idea of that fabulous shoe that every elite athlete today wears, that that in initial idea really was developed uh, between, you know, I don't know, who talked about it first, but it really was started with a stiff play between Benno and, and Darren, who really came up with the concept. And you know, now it's copied worldwide. And those of you who follow track and field realize that everybody is running infinitely faster than they ever were before. Um, there's a lot of his former students here, and I think that speaks for itself. But he also won, you know, uh, multiple outstanding uh, supervisor, graduate student, uh, supervisor mentorship awards, for example, from the Faculty of Biomedical Engineering and also in kinesiology at various points. And then the other, the other thing from awards that I wanted to emphasize was the 2015 ISB uh, fellowship, because ISB is the International Society for Biomechanics, so kind of the world governing body of what we are doing here in biomechanics. And, uh, and in 2015, they decided to have this fellowship, elected fellowship program. And uh, so that was the first time. And, and Darren was, uh, you know, one of those inaugural fellows. And, and I'm going, I remember some of the other people, and they were all really, really old already at the time. And in 2015, he was still very, very young. And I thought he must have been by far the youngest person to be that that uh, that thing uh, that received that fellowship. But uh, Taya Fini is there as well, and I'm not sure how you compare in terms of age, but I think she's probably two three years older. But all the rest is like 20 years older. So again, um, an award that you could argue was received at a time, you know, very early in the career that most people get, you know, in their 60s and 70s or even later, and and, and you know. And, you can figure out how old it was when you received that. Um, there's always a, a service component as well that we have in academia. And again, I would like to just highlight a few things. So for the Faculty of Kinesiology and the University, he was the Associate Dean Graduate Study for three years. But then for me, and I think also for, for Ben Onig, uh, some of the highlights in terms of service really were the international scientific conferences. So when, when I chaired the 2019 organ, uh, you know, organizing uh, uh, of the International Society of Biomechanics in Calgary was on the organizing committee. But I think even more importantly, very, very early in his career there in 1999, he was a secretary general for the ISP conference. And at the time, you know, Beno uh, was the chairperson of the conference, but Darren was a secretary general. And I remember Darren was the one that did 80% of the work, I mean, and I'm not saying that because uh, because of celebrating him. He really was the one 
that from an administrative point of view, from the organization of everything, you know, really made that conference happen. And not only that, he then was also the chairperson for the satellite symposium uh, on footwear biomechanics. Uh, uh, yeah, if I remember correctly, it was up in Canmore. And uh, so, you know, having two conferences, uh, important conferences back, back to back there, and that's the type of service he delivered. And then in, in 2002, when we hosted the World Conference of Biomechanics, I guess it was just obvious that uh, Darren would be again the Secretary General. Enormous amount of work. I mean, I'm talking weeks and months of work that you give away for making uh, such such a thing happen. And that that was Darren. And well, I was just uh, had, had had lunch with uh, Jay over lunchtime. We we talked about like uh, you know what is Darren to us, and I I said and, and Jay said exactly the same. You know, he's the guy who gets things done. And that's how it's always been. And definitely with the conferences that I was associated with him, he was the guy to, to get things done if you needed to get things done. And then also, you know, was the chairperson for the International Society of Biomechanics Technical Group and Functional Footwear. And not only was he the chairperson there, but, you know, went, went through all the ranks of, um, of, you know, being the vice chairperson and, and you know, many other uh, positions that in that particular group uh, he occupied. So trainees, you know, I'm, I'm glad to see so many trainees. I, you know, I looked at postdocs and I, I knew that Claudiana Fukuchi and Bill Wanup and, and Jay Waterbitz um, would, would be here. And, you know, they, they all have their little story, you know, like Claudiana with her husband, Reginaldo, they are here again, you know, but they were here before, you know, it's kind of like people come here, they go away, they come back. Uh, Bill Wanup, of course, came here and stayed here and, you know, and, and might stay here for, for, for a long, long time. And, and then Jay, as I mentioned, like with Gung and, and, and a variety of other people, you know, went, went into industry, Nike. I, and I see Nikki there, uh, who I'll, I think I'll be talking about in a second as well. Yeah, I'll talk about you in a second as well. So <laughs> I leave that for the moment. But, you know, uh, lots of people going into industry and, uh, you know, and, and then doing great things and uh, you know if i'm properly oriented then nick is now director of athlete science adidas usa just correct me and so very very high position you know in in that organization and then uh, bill and 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 Gung, i already talked about you know bill for those who shouldn't know it you know is here an adjunct uh, professor at the moment and uh, you know uh, maybe even maybe even more in the near future and then I saw Blaine Hettinger is here as well. And, you know, Blaine and Jay, they kind of overlapped. They were kind of here almost at, at, the, at the same time. And when I looked last, uh, Jay was director of footwear research and Nike. I'm not sure that's still correct. Still correct, yeah. But the one thing that I wanted to say about Blaine and Jay, and that also shows a little bit about uh, the training that Darren provided for them, because one year, and I forgot what the year was, they were asked to teach kinesiology 263, the undergraduate biomechanics class. I'm not sure what happened, but we didn't have anybody teaching it. So Blaine and Jay jumped in. The dean was nervous. So the dean said, well, you better sit there, you know, once a week or so in the, in the back of the class. And so once a week or so, I sat in the back of the class and, and listened to it. And I told them already before, not now, I've told them that before, they taught that class better than I ever did. When I came, I probably taught that class for 15 or 20 years, but they did an infinitely better job than I did. I think they taught that class better than anybody has ever taught 263. It was, was brilliant. They were prepared. They were interacting with the students. They, they're answering questions. They, uh, you know, in, in a way, like you would really expect from a senior lecturer, and here they were, you know, some mid-career PhD student and just did a fabulous, fabulous job. And I think, I think that goes back to the training, you know, that, that they received with Darren. And then why am I uh, mentioning SK Park? Uh, that just was an afterthought. You know, he was uh, uh, the first PhD student of Darren's. He has now a job in Korea for a long time. But yesterday afternoon, his daughter, <laughs> Megan Park, comes to me because she wants to work in the HBL. So it's kind of like that family affair thing, you know, with the Fukuchis and, uh, and, uh, and the parks and uh, the one-ups and, you know, so it's, uh, 
Anyway. Yeah. Yeah. You know, and then, you know, it's just some hard facts that some, some of the scientists in here might be interested. So yesterday when I looked at Google Scholar, uh, he had uh, this many career citations, age index, 148 publications. But the interesting thing for me was when I then looked at the, how many of these 140 ar 148 articles contained the word stiffness. There were 21 articles there. And, you know, and this, this is the first one that I found that really talked about midsole bending stiffness. Stephanition, NIG, 2000, influence of midsole bending stiffness on joint energy and jump high performance, medicine, science, and sport and exercise. It had 241 citations, but I added probably made millions, if not billions, for Nike. That initial idea at, at one point was published uh, in 2000 from this laboratory. And, and I, I think, you know, you can measure impact by citations. You can measure impact with how you influence that, you know, and, and having been a lifelong runner, you know, just the idea how fast people now run because of that development that I think is fair to say started here and then with Jay and Gang and other people, you know, uh, you know, uh, was then realized, uh, in, you know, in, in, in industry. I think that's just absolutely fabulous. So I thought I talked a little bit about, you know, what, what I thought or the things that stuck out for me for Darren, but, uh, you know, in my last slide, I thought I should say what Darren, uh, says about himself. So he has this company, Sport Insight, and if you go onto the whim, uh, onto that uh, website, then uh, you read, and I assume Darren wrote this, so you read, Darren is a mechanical engineer with specialization in biomechanics. Dr. Stephanie has been working with industry partners for over 25 years, having collaborated with world leaders such as Adidas, TaylorMade, Marxwork Warehouse, Ariad International, the Canadian Olympic team, as well as sport leagues such as the NHL, the NBA, and the NFL, signed Darren's definition, president. So that's how he sees himself. I see him as the guy that gets things done. And now the guy that gets things done uh, will have uh, uh, his word. And so very great welcome to everybody. Welcome to Darren. Thank you very much for doing this. I'm tremendously looking forward to what you have to say. They never get there alone. There's there's so many people that help them get to that point, and that's totally true for me. So I could honestly spend as much time as Walter spent just thanking people and going through that, but I won't do that because I'm sure I've missed somebody. So I'll just start off by, by saying thank you to, to everyone. Um, special thank you to my wife, Terry. She, you know, just the other day, she basically told me, said, I still love you, even though you're 
Don't get a paycheck anymore. <laughs> <laughs> it's always good for me. <laughs> my family, some of them are, are here today. Thank you for your support. Um, thank you to my mentors. You know, many of them are in this room. They, they taught me so much about, about research, about science, about life in general. Um, and, and Walter mentioned a handful of my students, but I, I really can't thank my graduate students, my postdocs, all those people enough, because it's been a true honor and pleasure. And I was going to say to work with you, but that would be unfair. It's more like to watch you work. <laughs> we all know that they're the ones that do all the work. So it really is it's humbling to have the graduate students that I've had and to see them go to the places that they've gone. It makes me, makes me really proud. So thank you for that. Thank you to everyone in the lab. Thank you to everyone in the, in the faculty, my friends, my colleagues, my collaborators, a lot of which are here today. It, it really, I couldn't have think of another place where I could have spent 30 years and, and had as much fun as, as I have. So um, yeah, with that, I just want to start by, by saying that I'm going to throw out a few quotes in, in this presentation. And, and this is a quote from Albert Schweitzer. And I really like this quote. And if you don't know Albert Schweitzer, he's got a handful of really fantastic quotes. But this is one. It says, wherever a man turns, you can find someone who needs him. And from my perspective, anyone in science, anyone in research, the real goal of doing that science or research is to help someone. We're learning new information. We're getting new knowledge. And at the end of the day, that's going to be used to help somebody in some way. And so as, as Walter said, when I first started, I started with Dr. Jack Ainsworth. And the reason I started with Dr. Ainsworth is because one of the research directions that he was interested in was in baloney amputees, and specifically in children baloney amputees. So that was very attractive to me. And so I started working with him, and I'll never forget, about a month into working with, with Jack, I went into his office, and he had this huge grin on his face. So I was nervous already, but I went into his office and he goes to me, we're going to make you into an amputee. <laughs> and so I took a half step back and before I knew what he was talking about, he basically meant he was going to make me walk like an amputee. So this was my very first research project. And you can imagine, I'm just coming into the lab and for some reason he figured we needed to put markers on my chest as well. <laughs> <laughs> I still don't know where that data went. <laughs> I can guarantee you that there's never a shortage of people that were standing up around in the balcony there when I was doing my, my work here. But basically, for the first few months, I was walking like an amputee. So we made an ankle foot arthrosis for me, which basically made me walk like an amputee. The forces were very, very similar. The kinematics were very, very similar. I had to wear this thing several hours a day. And so for a few months, I was basically at home walking around like an amputee. And the whole goal was to try to understand or to manipulate or remove properties and slowly change properties of this prosthetic limb to see how that changes amputee gait to better understand so that we can manipulate and make better prosthetics for, for baloney amputees. And on top of walking around half naked with my shorts picked up so it looks like a diaper, <laughs> I'm walking around in shoes that are, you know, six inches high because we needed to allow for this, this foot underneath that basically was a, was a prosthetic foot. And that actually led to my very first publication. But before I do that, I just want to draw your attention to this little piece of basketball court here. And if I remember, I'll get back to a story that's associated with that little basketball court as well. But that really led to my first publication. That was my very first scientific publication. It was with Jack Ainsford. It was entitled a pilot study to test the influence of specific prosthetic features in preventing transtibial amputees from walking like able bodied subjects. N equals one. So, <laughs> but basically, the whole plan was then to take that further. But at that point in time, it was exactly what happened, what Walter mentioned. Jack took a position at Washington University in St. Louis, left me orphaned here as a graduate student. And thankfully, at that time, Benno took me in, and that's when I started kind of working a little bit more in the, the sport biomechanics realm. So just a few projects that I really enjoyed working on in sport biomechanics and thinking about trying to help people. This was a project that we worked on with the Olympic Oval. So it was really initiated by Jacques Thibault, who was the director of the Olympic Oval at the time. And he was seeing some horrendous injuries in short track speed skating. So short track speed skating, as everyone knows, there's a lot of collisions that go on, a lot of people slide into the boards, 
And at the time, the padding just really wasn't cutting it. It wasn't doing what it was needing to do. So we were trying to explore with whether we could come up with a new padding system for short track speed skating. And so we played with all different kinds of pads. We looked at closed cell phones, open cell phones, different combinations. We did a lot of drop tests on these phones, but then ultimately we wanted to try to test them kind of in their configuration. Um, here to luge, put a bunch of weight on it to make sure the athlete, or sorry, that the sled was about the same weight as the athlete. And then we just crashed them into the board. So this is me skating here, crashing the sled into the board. Obviously, I wasn't skating nearly fast enough, so we jerry-rigged this situation, which to this day still scares me, because <laughs> basically what we did here was we took surgical tubing, and we attached it to the wall, we attached it to the sled, and then none of us could pull it far enough, so what we did is we hooked it up then to a golf cart, <laughs> pulled the golf cart to about center ice, and let it go. And the first few times we let it go, we almost crapped their pants. <laughs> basically came crashing in. But at the end of the day, we were mimicking large forces, we were breaking things, but we really couldn't get down to what we needed to get down to. So thought about it for a while, we tried all different kinds of things, but at the end of it all, what we did was we had to remove the boards. So we came up with a system where we could remove the boards, put in large pads, allow some deformation. Anybody that knows Newton's laws, you allow time, you're gonna decrease those impact forces. And so the OVO really was kind of a pioneer in implementing this boardless system. And ultimately it became kind of the de facto system that everybody had to use after that point in time. So again, Chuck did a lot of work on this and it was a lot of fun, but at the end of the day, hopefully it's, it's helping some people. Another thing that I've been interested in is running injuries for a long period of time. We did a, a prospective study with Benno several years ago where we were able to identify that runners that have knee injuries tended to have really high loads in the frontal plane and in the transverse plane at the knee joint. So these high moments, these bending stresses, these torsional stresses were seeming to be correlated with the telephomeral pain syndrome, for example, which is the number one running injury. And so the question then becomes, well, now that you know that, so what, what can you do about that? And this is where having some industry partners is really great because they have the technologies, they have the resources. And so this was a fantastic collaboration with Adidas. And I have to say, Adidas has been a long time collaborator with my research for 30 years, literally the very first project I did with Adidas was in 1994. So it's coming up on 30 years as of January. And with them, we had all kinds of discussions, came up with different prototypes, and the concept was, well, basically you probably can't change the forces that much, but you can change the direction of the forces or how the forces are acting on a person. So if you manipulate how someone lands, then maybe you can change or modify those forces. So we came up with these systems that if anybody's worked with industry, you know, you go through lots of different names so you get to basically a commercial system that they're happy with, but it started with X, Y, Z, and then GCS ground control. But basically what it was, was a system that allowed some relative movement of the heel relative to the, to the upper part of the midsole. And what that did was it allowed to redirect or basically control the direction of the ground reaction forces. And that ultimately reduced the loading at the knee joint. And there were different ways that that could be done. There were different types of systems that we came up with. So opportunities to work with industry. And again, I have to thank Benno for that way back when he introduced me to, to doing industry projects. And that's really been at kind of the core of a lot of the research that I've been doing for, for over 30 years. The other thing I wanted to talk a little bit about is, is innovation. So this quote from Steve Jobs says, innovation distinguishes between a leader and a follower. And so already you've seen some of the, the projects that we are working on, trying to be innovative, trying to come up with ways for new products, new developments. But I want to touch on, on a few other fun projects that we worked on over the years as well. So as Walter mentioned, I have a love of carbon fiber plates, basically been putting them in shoes for 20 years. And it all started with, with my PhD thesis, as you mentioned, again, working with Benno, trying to understand just basic running mechanics, basic jumping mechanics, and taking that information into a product that ultimately, in some way or another, had a potential influence on performance. 
But these simple carbon fiber plates have not only got me a lot of publications, as well as they've shown, they've also given me a lot of opportunities. So again, this was a lot of work and development with Adidas. And at the time, when we were first starting working with these plates, which was the mid 1990s, Adidas was sponsoring the Cuban national team. So you can imagine as a graduate student who's working on a project, knowing that Adidas is sponsoring the Cuban national team and working with Adidas and having an opportunity to go to Cuba to actually collect data. That was, that was unbelievable at that point. But we had a lot of athletes trying these plates and Ivan Pedroso was the world champion long jumper at the time. So he was a Cuban athlete and we went down there and I wanted to try to get him in these, in these plates, in these shoes, in these prototypes. So he was very respectful, but also very dismissive. So I went to him and I almost begged him to try, you know, these shoes on and I was not successful. We were there for about three days. I went to him the second day, same thing. He didn't want to have anything to do. Third day, I think he was either getting annoyed or was feeling sorry for me. He basically said, okay, I'll try these plates. So he took the plates, did one jump with the plates, came back and said, I'm keeping these shoes. <laughs> and when I told him, no, I'm sorry. <laughs> he then looked at the Adidas guy and he said, when are you making me a new pair? So when he had that, and we also had a lot of data, like we knew we were onto something, or, but there was at least something going on with these particular things. Another totally unrelated project is what we were working on for on the 40 before the Vancouver Olympics. So this is kind of one of, at least in my career time, one of the first times where there's actually some money put forward from the Canadian, Canadian sport, Canadian Olympic Committee to actually help develop from a technical aspect, the equipment for the different athletes. And it really was fun playing with these guys, working with the Paralympic sledge hockey team in Canada. I had an opportunity to actually play with the sledges and get on that. And I can tell you it was a massively humbling experience. But what we did is we just kind of looked at everything. We said, well, they have basically their sledges, which consist of a bucket and blades and a carrier and a frame. And what can we do with respect to that? And then they have a stick. And if you're not familiar with the sledge hockey, they use the stick to shoot the puck, but they also use the stick to propel themselves, right? So it's kind of a, a two-fold piece of equipment. So we looked into some of that. We looked into some of their protective equipment. And it was an opportunity to be innovative. So traditionally, these sledges have two parallel blades. All they did was took ice hockey skate blades and put them on in the past. Didn't make a lot of sense that you actually needed four corners. So now you have two systems. So we changed things from the blade profile. We did some finite element modeling to try to reduce the mass, but to keep the, the strength of the materials necessary for the systems, we revamped and modified basically the, the carrier. We did all this work on that. We looked also at the buckets, and this is Blaine here, who was our token subject. He was basically there modifying and manipulating. We changed the positions on, on the buckets. We changed whether you could custom mold the buckets. And I can tell you, I said I wasn't going to show you any data, but I can tell you that we definitely improved their speeds. Their straight line speeds, we could improve by 5 to 10%. So there's a lot of factors going on with that. We looked at their, their sticks, as I mentioned. So if we looked at what they had, and one of the problems with the sticks is they would engage with the ice, but they would chip away the ice so bad that as they were pushing off, they would slip or they would slide. So can you re-modify or change those, those pick patterns? And so we were able to improve their performance with, with those components and those aspects as well. And so at the end of the day, we came up with an almost revolutionized, revamped system and I can honestly say that they took about 5% of the inputs that we gave them. So I think there's tons of opportunity that can still be done there. And kind of like Ivan Control, so sometimes some of the people you work with or the groups you work with are a little bit hesitant to change, right? And same with those stiff plates. We knew about those stiff plates 20, 25 years ago. Sometimes it just takes time before things actually get, get implemented. Another project with some innovation, again, it was based on some research that Ben and I did together during my PhD, so a long time ago. And again, we were just looking at real basic mechanics of how people run, how they jump, how they sprint, how they do those sorts of things. And what we found is that 
joints like the ankle joint, the knee joint, and a little bit less, but also somewhat the hip joint, kind of act like springs. And it's not surprising that in some cases you can replace joints like the ankle joint with a spring, and you can still have some very, very good performances. So the question we had though was what if you actually supplement the joint with external springs? Is that going to have an influence on performance? And so this was a, again a nice collaboration with Adidas. And what they developed was the Adidas Tech Fit one, where they had external springs that were placed on or external elements on suits. And we could show that we could increase vertical jump, sprint, and running performance. So almost even three exoskeletons, there's a lot of exoskeletons out there now. This is things that we were playing with about 20 years ago of adding external elements and springs to be able to, to increase performance. And again, we took it another step further. So again, blame me in the tokens. <laughs> we went a bit crazy with tight suits. One of the problems with external elements or exoskeletons is they have to be pretty tight to be able to, to get it. So again, the stiffness, which is a theme in my research apparently, basically the stiffness is important, but I can tell you that some of those tech fit apparel that we had before could increase performance by one to 2%. We actually could get lane jumping about six or seven percent higher when we were playing with some of these suits. So there's a lot of work again still to be done with this, but there is some opportunities to get people to jump back. And the other thing that's a bit of a theme throughout my research is, is playing and having fun and enjoying the game. And when people used to ask me what I do for work or whatever, I would explain and I would say, you know, I work on different pieces of equipment and I get the see different athletes and all that sort of stuff. But at the end of the day, I'm actually just, I'm playing. I'm playing with all of these different aspects. So I've really been fortunate to be able to enjoy all of those aspects. And so one of the things I also really enjoyed was getting out of the lab. And what I mean by that is we did a bunch of field work throughout the years. So some of the field work, it's challenging. It's always difficult to do field work, but it's really an opportunity to do some, some really fun things. So I took a look and just quickly look at some of the different types of sports that I've been involved in over the past uh, 30 plus years. And it's somewhere in the order of about 40 different sports where we've actually collected data and had data that we're interested in. Everything from traditionally sprinting and running and speed skating, like I mentioned, all the way to mixed martial arts and pickleball. So we've just done a project on pickleball sports sports. We've done things on tie-dye roping, bobsled, luge, kind of, you name it, it's been fun. It's been an opportunity to really, really play on so many different sports. And so with that, we're going to have a little bit of a guess in the game. So this is some field research, and some of you might be familiar with this. This is basically a Fuji film or a pressure film where you can quantify pressure. So any guesses what sport we were working on when we captured this pressure here? Horses. Horses, close, no. Yeah, some people know. So this was bull riding. So if you want to do a crazy project, try, <laughs> try putting a pressure sensor underneath the bull suit. <laughs> so this is the, the tape that you see here. This was a project we did with Dale Butterwick. Dale was really interested in protective equipment for bulls, specifically um, bull riders' vests. So to be able to develop a bull riding vest, you got to understand what kind of forces are going to be applied to a bull riding vest. So this was up at Olds College. There were a few people in the room that were there. That was probably one of the most fun projects, but one of the craziest, scariest projects we ever did. Is that on the bull? <laughs> <laughs> All right, so another guessing game. So this is a situation where a lot of people will, will know or recognize this type of data. This is pressure insole data. So we'll put insoles underneath the foot between the foot and the shoe. And we can collect and quantify what the pressure is underneath the foot. But any guesses what this sport is when you look at that pressure data? Here, we'll do that one more time. Ballet? Ballet, no. Sorry? No. What across? Motocross, no. Island dance. Sorry? Island dance. No. Rodeo. 
So this was a project we did with Harriet, and that's actually from tie down slopers. So we quantified and measured pressure between the foot and the, the shoe. Here's the tie down slopers, and that's the pressure that they had. We actually developed a, an instrument and stirrup as well that we put on to quantify forces so that we could have the forces, we could have the pressures to be able to develop some, some cowboy boots. And this will be the last one. This is 3D motion capture. What's that from? <laughs> yeah, exactly. So if you didn't hear that, basically what that is, is a project we did with Fox Motorsports. And I can tell you, going to work and being, this is your work day, watching these guys and capturing that data, that's a fun day at work. Right? So these guys were amazing. These are all top level motocross riders. This is actually a personal track. So you know they're doing well when you got their own personal track. <laughs> But to be able to work with that level of athlete with the, that type of thing, that's really fun. That's really what it comes down to. And I've had the opportunity to admire some fantastic athletes basically get paid to go to, to Sydney to the Olympics to collect data. And when I say collect data, it's setting up a little video camera and pressing play. So <laughs> it's not too bad. And being literally front row. And when I mean front row, this is where we were. We were in front of the front row. We were right on the track virtually collecting this data. And I was there to see Mo Green and Adam Bolden come in first and second in 100 meters. And again, it was a bit of a special day because I have Adam's shoe because we were working on that with Adidas. So to be able to see him run and come in second with some of the work that we were doing was fantastic. I was able to take a couple of graduate students with me. This is Katrina LeMay-Dome winning the gold medal. Again, front row seats at the Salt Lake Olympics. Again, being paid by the International Olympic Committee to go and collect data there, it's not a bad game. And I've enjoyed all that work, had the opportunity. Again, this is in Sydney. So this is setting up before the races. And there was a couple of, okay, they were pretty big bodyguards that were making their loops around. So we had to time it that they were on the back part of the, <laughs> of the stadium. And we all took our turn of, of doing the hurdle jump here. And a couple minutes later, they both walked by and they said, don't do that again. <laughs> <laughs> so they were very good about it, but they kind of let us get away. This was a, a field trip that working with Adidas when we were first testing out some of the tech fit. And this is the Adidas employees. And you can see how much fun I'm having here. But basically, some of you may know this gentleman, this is Dr. Albert Ballhofer. So he's a professor or just retired, but he was a professor at the University of Freiburg. So both of us were working on these projects, consulting with Adidas, and we were there testing out these suits. And you can see again how much fun we're having. But look at the Adidas guys. They got their two external professor consultants running around chasing each other. So they're all smiling as well. <laughs> but I have to tell you a little story about Albert. So Albert, as it goes, was actually my external examiner for my PhD thesis. So to be able to collaborate with him and work with him many years later was, was a real special treat. And after my PhD thesis, I went back to my office and on my desk was a bottle of schnapps. And Albert had left me a bottle of schnapps on my desk. So basically, the moral of the story is, if you can get an external examiner to leave you a bottle of schnapps on your desk when you're done, you're doing pretty good. <laughs> I've had the pleasure of not only organizing conferences, but going to conferences, participating and seeing and meeting old friends and colleagues that have worked here in the lab that you don't get an opportunity to see very often. I'm lucky for these conferences to be at the HBL Christmas parties and building or designing, developing different types of gingerbread cookies with human faces on them, all the members of the lab we did one year, which was fun. So it's really been an enjoyable experience, an opportunity to, to have fun over these, these past 30 years. Now, I'm going to end because the question you always get, or I've been getting a crazy amount over the past few weeks, is what's next? Everybody always goes, so what are you going to do now? The simple answer is whatever I want. <laughs> <laughs> well, the nice part is, is I'm going to keep enjoying my journey. And what that means is I'm not going to give up research cold turkey after 30 years. That's probably impossible. 
I still have some projects, I still have some grants, I have some great collaborations, so I hope to continue doing some of that research as well, so will be coming in here part time. I still have one graduate student, I won't name names, but he doesn't seem to be in any hurry to get up. <laughs> 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 and then the other part is my last quote is if the women don't find you handsome, they should at least find you handsome. <laughs> so I consider myself a little bit handy and I've been doing that, and that brings me back to the to the basketball court in that first picture. That basketball court was when Jack left, as I said, I switched over to Benno, and my very first industry project was working on that basketball court. Now, those were basketball courts for, for Robin, Robins, which is a company that makes courts, and, and a lot of them are used in the NBA. And we had, we had a handful of courts. They were like 10 feet by 10 feet and 20 feet by 20 feet, so they were pretty big. And at the end of it, then I was going, what the hell are we going to do with these courts? They're all here. What are we going to do? I said, don't worry, I'll take care of it. So one weekend, I spent my whole weekend painfully taking them apart piece by piece, and they ended up in my living room. So I basically had this beautiful maple hardwood floor <laughs> that was paid for by Robin in the project that they had had. <laughs> Flash forward 30 years, and we're still doing a project with Robins, which is fantastic. We've had some, again, awesome collaborations with industry partners. But they delivered some hardwood courts to us, smaller this time, and we're supposed to test them on the force platform. Problem is, I don't know if it's... <laughs> Imperial metric US Canada thing, they made them the wrong size. They probably can't understand centimeters, but that's because. <laughs> so we had to cut them, we had to change them. And again, thinking I'm the handy person I am, I said, no problem, I'll take care of it. Came here early one morning. I usually get here pretty early anyway. Came here early one morning, started cutting these these different um, samples, and wasn't awake enough, it wasn't bright enough, and I was cutting through some of the metal. Um, cleats that were there, so it dulled my blade really quickly, and the next thing I know, I'm burning the wood rather than cutting the wood, and so Phil tested it because he was upstairs, but basically there's smoke everywhere, <laughs> the fire alarms going off, and the next thing I know, the fire department's there, everybody in the factory of kinesiology, it's got to get out of the kinesiology, and I used to go to the gym first thing in the morning, so I know what a pain in the butt it is when you got to leave the gym at that point in time, so my apologies to everybody. I didn't get out of here without setting off the fire alarm. Now it's about <laughs> four months ago. On that part. But in addition to doing some work here, really what's next is a couple of things. Some of you know, my wife, Terry, and I are building a new house. So over the next few months, kind of focus will be on trying to finish that up and complete that. And one of the reasons for me personally for, for wanting to build a new house is to get a workshop. So this is my new workshop. It's about 1,200 square feet. And if I'm not here in the lab, you're gonna be able to find me in that workshop. And I'll be doing things like woodworking, metalworking, leatherworking, concrete making. I like making things with my hands. And so ultimately I'll be spending a ton of time in that, in that workshop. So with that, maybe a little bit longer than Walter's talk, but not much. <laughs> <laughs> so again, thank you very much to everyone. Really appreciate the opportunity to do this today. Really appreciate all of you being here, especially those of you that have come from out of town. It's it's really humbling to have you to come back to Calgary just for this. And um, yeah, thank you very much. And against your better judgment, we did it anyway. And I think it was great before that. I, I chatted with Darren before, and so he said he'd be happy to take a few questions. And you're not going to make this long, but maybe I'll finish it up in 10, 12 minutes. But uh, if, if anybody would like to get some life advice, research advice, construction <laughs> advice, uh, here is your opportunity. So any questions that you might have? Where's the new place? How are we going to drop by if we don't know the address? <laughs> yeah. The new place is in Bearspot, just outside town, across from across from Preston's house. <laughs> you drop by, you can visit both of us. Address is 35 Bearspot, Green. <laughs> 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 <laughs>
his house has got the beer. <laughs> I have a little question. You know, I saw that you were working with some 30, 40 companies and so on. And it also about different sports, I guess. And uh, was that by choice? Or would you have like, you know, like some people in this room that they do one sport, you know, from the beginning of the career to the end of the career, and you have chosen to do very many different things. Uh, was that a personal choice? Was that uh, just happening? Or how did that come about? Yeah, the, the simple answer is yeah, that was that was personal choice. And, and what I mean by that is um, I've had some opportunities to work in industry, um, like leave academia. Okay, long story, I, I never thought I would be an academic. I really never thought. I thought I would graduate, I thought I would go work in industry. Um, but at the time when I graduated, I was working with Benno and doing work on a handful of different industry projects, which I really, really enjoyed. The opportunity came up to have an academic position, but still continue some of that work, which I really enjoyed. And the reason I never thought I'd be an academic is because I didn't want to be exactly that. I didn't want to work on only one thing all the time. And as I just mentioned, I had some opportunities to be in industry, but then that would mean I'm probably focusing more on one thing or one sport or something like that. And that was just not as appealing to me as being able to play with all these different sports, to try different things. And there's some corollaries when you start thinking about the interaction between an athlete and a piece of equipment there's things you can learn in one sport that will be applicable in other sports. And so, um, yeah, that was a choice. I always wanted to work on a lot of different things. I've uh, got to play with you with some sports growing up with soccer and hockey. And I know what a vicious competitor you can be. Um, what's your favorite sport right now? Uh, uh, so, <laughs> um, as of like a couple, uh, almost two months ago, I blew up my ACL and my MCL playing hockey. So right now I'm playing nothing. I would love to still be playing hockey and playing soccer now that Robin started it back up after not but so unfortunately I'm laid up a little break for this. Yeah. I mean, yeah. So I'm curious in kind of bird's eye, what is something that has what's something you thought was true when you started and it's been disproved? Or like what what do you feel like you seen that you kind of like, oh this doesn't exist. Yeah, um, I don't know what doesn't exist anymore, but um, lots. <laughs> it's really what it comes down to. So there's a lot of things that when I was, you know, 30 years ago, I kind of believed or thought. Um, so a simple one is what Walter was talking about with those with those plates, right? So we believed that one of the things was just we were reducing the amount of energy lost in the system. And I think that still plays a little role, but I don't think it plays as much of a role as, as some of the other things that are going on. For example, so I think there's a lot of other aspects with kind of shifting the point of application of the ground reaction force. There's a lot of other things going on. Um, so that's just one example, but there's, there's a lot of things that uh, that I once thought I knew and I don't know anymore. I don't want to force it, but this is your opportunity. I know. Uh oh. <laughs> so everybody says <laughs> you say everybody thinks it. <laughs> the story about Leibniz. Leibniz was a German researcher that was developing the development of calculus. And there was a huge fight between Leibniz and Newton, who really invented calculus. And that is said, you know, it's like that, that when you have a new idea that people say, yeah, it's wrong. But about 10 years later, they say it's right, but it's what it goes. And about another 10 years later, they say it's right, it's a book that somebody else invented. And I would like to make quite clear that you have the primary right for the place. I remember so well you came to my office and you said, you know, unbelievable, they don't do anything with the M Metastatal choice. And they sprint, they don't do anything, they don't push that, they just lose energy. And I looked at the images that you had and said, that's your idea. 
and Nike was really quick in 20 some years. They developed a shoe out of that. Yeah, well, thank you. Man. There's a couple things, you know. So Nike shoe has a lot more to it than just the plate. There's a lot of things going on there. But also, I, I truly believe like any idea, it's not just one person's idea. It always comes from working with a lot of people. Um, there's so many people involved in development of different ideas and innovation and that sort of thing, which is which is the fun part. And so, um, yeah. Yeah, but somebody put forward. <laughs> <laughs> Anybody else who wants to give credit to Gary for, <laughs> for an idea? In the back there, yeah. Thanks, Darren, for doing this. Um, I'm curious, just in your, as you're taking more time to reflect, what's something you'd want early career investigators to know now that you know now? Yeah, a few things. Um, take good pictures and keep track of them. <laughs> so there was one I was going through, I wanted to include some pictures of this sort of stuff. And some, some really fun projects that didn't, didn't have them or couldn't find them. The other thing is, is think about um, an opportunity to set something up for the long term. And what I mean by that is knowing what I know now and all the projects that we did, if we would have been smart 20, 30 years ago and basically set up a, a database of these projects or set up a situation where we could have kept track and, and just every time we've had hundreds of hundreds of athletes come to the lab, if we could have collected like one piece of information on them and, and just have that consistently throughout all the projects, to be able to do that after like a 20, 30 year career, you would have information, you would have data that no one else kind of has. And, and it's not easy and it's not cheap and all that sort of, but sometimes it can't. And sometimes it's not a lot of extra work, it's an extra few minutes. You just have this wild, crazy idea. What if, you know, what about this? Just, just do it, just measure it. Right. Anybody else? Yeah. What's uh, one piece of like data or result or a finding that would just blew you away or completely surprised you? I completed um, something, and I still don't trust it hundred percent. But basically, <laughs> that um, data from the mole, for example. Like we were getting forces that were about 20 times that holes weight when they were coming down, right? And it wasn't just one set of data, it was multiple sets of data. So I'd love to repeat that experiment. I would never repeat that experiment. <laughs> <laughs> I would love to repeat that experiment because that's that's one of my biggest regrets is that we never achieved what we wanted to achieve with that particular project. So, but it wasn't an easy project. Along the same lines, because I know that happened in my life on a couple of occasions. Have you ever done an experiment, you know, and the purpose and the hypothesis, and you kind of know what's going to come out? But then you do the experiment, and it comes out completely different, and it completely changes the way how you think about something. Has that ever happened to you as well? Oh, yeah. <laughs> yeah, lots of times. You know, I, I can't think of it off the top of my head, but I know for a fact that there's multiple times. Those are the fun projects, to be totally honest. And when you say you knew how it's going to come up, well, obviously you didn't know how it's going to come up. <laughs> but I can tell you, you think you know how it's going to come up, and when it comes out totally opposite, honestly, those are some of the most fun because it's kind of like, well, now what the hell is going on? And it's kind of like, should have been like this. I thought it was going to be like this. It's totally opposite. So that's when the fun began. It's kind of like, okay, why? What do we have to do now to basically understand why? And all those types of so there's, there's been a lot of situations with some of the innovation when we basically say, okay, if we make a product, this is what it should be, right? And, and so some things that are coming to mind now, it's basically like if we change the mass of a golf club head, for example, and people swing, in theory, they should swing slower because the mass is, is higher. Not everybody does. A lot of people do, a lot of people don't. So what are they changing or what are they, you know, are people sort of controlling the forces they're inputting? Are they controlling the kinematics? Is there position control people or the force control people? So the wonderful thing about biomechanics is you'll get all kinds of different results. The frustrating thing about biomechanics is you'll get all kinds of different results <laughs> depending on the people, right? And depending on what they're doing. So um, yeah, so many times, for lack of a better term, I get wrong. And that's honestly that's the most fun when you're wrong to think you've got to get wrong. Time for another question. Somebody got the last question. 
If not, then okay, and well, I will say a few words here. So stick around. <laughs> okay, hopefully everyone out there can, can hear this. Uh, so yeah, my name is Jay. I worked with Darren for 13 years here. Uh, so Everyone can clearly see by this presentation, Darren's a doer, Darren goes, Darren works, 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 works. The other half of that though, is that Darren doesn't like ceremony. Darren doesn't like accolades. Darren doesn't like to be the center of attention. Darren doesn't like gifts. Darren doesn't like attention. Darren doesn't like any of those things. I promise you there's one uncomfortable person in the room here. And that's boss. <laughs> uh, everything Bill and I are gonna say, it basically been covered in the last hour, but um, we have to do it again because you learned this far. <laughs> um, so I think kind of there's sort of one point that I'd like to kind of bring up. And um, you did see it right here. Darren cranks. Darren, he goes. He works. He drives. He doesn't always get the credit for the stuff that he does. You all just saw Benno try and give him credit for the plate. He didn't really even take it. So that's kind of how the boss that I know. And so that's why we have to be here and we have to sit them down and we have to extend this out and we have to make sure that, that we're properly celebrating Darren for the boss he is and things he's done because the presentation was good, you said it was good. <laughs> There's still a lot in there that I think we really need to take a minute and like, and, and really hammer home. Um, so from a real high level, uh, you know, I wanted to zone out and just kind of give a perspective from I'm an outsider now. And so from the footwear, you know, science, footwear industry perspective, uh, today's kind of a big deal. Uh, the reason I say that is that you go back to 1980, before Darren, before Benno, before HPL, before this was even kinesiology. Okay, so nothing was here back then until Benno got a call in Switzerland in 1980 from the dean at the time, at a very opportune time of day. Benno has a very funny story about how that time of phone call was strategically chosen. Benno came over here in 1980 before there was any of this. Benno built this castle. And I think the main point I'm trying to say is that Darren came here as a student. So Darren was raised, he was a product of this institution. Darren learned his research skills here. This place made him. Benno started the four science, the sport biomechanics in this place here. And there's no question that that legacy was continued with Darren. He took the torch, he helped make it deeper, broader, and even more impactful. So this institution was put on the map by Benno, and Darren really, really helped pave that way to push things through. Really toss me back. And so for one perspective, I really, I'm not trying to make this a nice thing, like this, but <laughs> I want to go in a little bit more detail about some of Darren's contributions. So if you go back to 2014, there were really three published scientific findings out there that suggested if you want to tune a midsole to max to enhance running economy, this is what you should do. The first one is the mass rule. So for every 100 grams of mass you have to shoot, you lose 1% running economy. That's from Ned Frederick. And so that's a, a, you know, a core foundational piece of footwear science. And obviously, that's why all these super shoes and marathons are relatively lightweight. The second published scientific finding out there was that carbon fiber plates seem to be able to enhance performance, not only in sprinting and jumping, but also in economy. That came from Darren. Darren drove that research that showed there is something there with carbon fiber plates and running economy. That's the reason all these shoes have carbon fiber plates as was talked about. But there's a third one. The third piece that was published back then was that if you want to enhance running economy, you don't go with a thin flat midsole you actually want a softer and more resilient midsole to enhance running economy. That was research that Darren drove. So at the time, in 2014, there were three published basically insights that directly spoke to if you want to enhance running economy, you know, think along these three, two thirds of those came from work that Darren drove. I don't think I've seen that spoken about or talked about or in the articles you sure know as hell that Darren wasn't going to like to go horn on that thing. So 
I think it's important on days like today, we force them to sit down, we force them to admit, dude, you kind of had an impact. And so that's why I want to basically like, kind of go through is that Darren really had a giant impact here. And so on a day like today, it's bittersweet because Darren had all these contributions. Admittedly, that's a Nike story, but there's two people here from Adidas, and I can't speak to this, but I can almost guarantee you, if you go into the Adidas Innovation Centers and you look at their future concepts walls, I bet you that Darren's definitions ideas are all over that place, which just tells me that we're going to continue to see Darren's ideas and products on the walls for years to come. So although his retirement starts here, we're going to see Darren's ideas in the walls in the future. However, I think the bigger thing to us is that today's bittersweet because Benno built this castle. Benno started the foundation of you know, modern footwear science here. He's done here. Darren helped carry that torch and helped keep that going. On a day like today where Darren retires, what happens now? He doesn't have big feet. He's like a size eight, but there's like <laughs> no other pair of size eight shoes that are bigger to fill in this context right now. And so it's almost like a comment to like the faculty and the dean, what happens now? You know, this place wasn't here. This institution didn't exist. It was created by Benno. It developed the researcher that Darren is. He came here as a student. He gave him an opportunity to be a PI and drive research. And Darren goes, 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 and you can see what he did. So what happens now? Like, you know, I can tell you this place is absolutely on the map. Adidas and Nike pay very close attention to what happens right here. And so on a day like this, I just have to ask, like when it's such a monu, like a giant retires, what, what happens next? And so hopefully we see what goes on and, and it continues forward. But I think that's the other piece for me is that, yeah, today we celebrate Darren. He did a whole bunch of stuff, but he also was a player in this bigger picture of development of science in footwear science and in sport biomechanics. And so the question that I think we have is, is what happens now? Um, those are going to keep going on a, a little bit apart, but also, I'm not sure, uh, we're going to keep this party going. I hope we see everyone over there because you earned this boss. We got to have, uh, we got to keep this, these stories going. So I please like hope to see everyone keep going because, um, this is Darren's day. Uh, similar to what Walter said, um, there's many ways in academ academia to measure success. You can number of papers, number of awards, money. But I think for Darren, his success should really be measured in his, his students. And the fact that there's so many of you here today is, is evidence to that. And not only are there a lot of students here, but they're, they're all highly, highly successful. So some work at Nike, like Jay, some work at Adidas, like Nikki. Some have gone on to, to work at, at Apple, like, like Gung. Some have gone on to, to medical school, like Brian Lunson back there. And, and actually, the more I highlight these highly successful people, I think I may be the least successful <laughs> of Darren's students. But, but, but anyway, um, Darren always drives and pushes his students to achieve their goals. I think we can all remember the time when we first went into his office sat down and he asked us, so what do you want to do five years from now, 10 years from now? And whatever we said, no matter what our goal was, he would push and drive us to help us accomplish those goals. And it wasn't just his former students that he would help. You'd, you'd, all, you'd often find students from other supervisors or faculty, both new and old, that would find their way into Darren's office. And they go there because he gives a honest and, and great opinion and he gives good advice. And sometimes he's, all the time, he's, he's brutally honest, which is why people go to him. And, and that's one of his, his shining traits, I think. So as you step into retirement, I hope you take pride in the legacy that you leave behind. A legacy of excellence, mentorship, and positive influence. Your impact will resonate in my future projects, as well as in the students that I mentor. And your contribution to the overall footwear science community will be missed and is immeasurable. 
So while your presence will be missed, I'm confident that the principles and values you have instilled in all of us will continue to guide our actions and decisions. And may your retirement be filled with well-deserved relaxation, new adventures, and the, no, and the joy of knowing that your legacy will endure through the accomplishments of those that you have mentored. So Walter kind of took my little shine a little bit on his intro, but um, Darren did celebrate his 55th birthday yesterday. And I think um, he's been mentioning for years that he was going to retire when he's 55. And I don't think a lot of people believed him, but he's, <laughs> off, he's off by one day. So that's as close as you can get. So Darren's, I guess, brutally honest, right, right to the end. Um, so with that said, we have a gift that we would like to present to you. So it's what we termed a retirement thesis. So we asked all former students to, to write out some anecdotes and kind of their, their thoughts and, and feelings of, of Darren in there, as well as the, the most meaningful sci scientific contribution that they, they had. So we left a couple empty pages at the end. So we're going to make that available at the LDL if anyone wants to add any, any notes or anything. So with that said, I offer congratulations to your retirement. And we can officially head to the LDL and, and get the party started, I guess. Thank you, Phil, Jay. That's great. So as was said, so uh, uh, we are all heading over to the LDL. Everybody is welcome. There will be some food, some drinks. And I also want to prepare people there will also be an open mic available after we have had our first glass of wine. <laughs> and uh, I'm expecting that some of the former students or other people will have uh, little anecdotes to uh, tell us about. That's always a lot of fun. So, so think about that anecdote that's been there in your mind for a long time. You always wanted to tell it and you never did. So now your opportunity will come. Thank you everybody for coming. Thank you, Darren, for agreeing to do this. And uh, let's go over there and have a drink. Yes. <laughs>